Welcome to um, the power of promoting pleasures of reading and writing. Um, thank you on behalf of American Reading Company and our speakers today for joining us. I am Megan Maloney, our Chief Academic Officer, and I'm really excited about the next hour that we will be spending talking about the pleasures of reading and writing, especially at this time of year, um, as we're thinking about the end of the school year, as well as other opportunities for extended learning time. We know how important that accelerating reading growth and writing growth are to students. And this is going to be a, a wonderful hour where we're going to hear from three of the top experts on this topic um, so that we can really do what's the best for our students and accelerating their reading and writing growth. So we will get started. Um, he's having a little bit of technical difficulties right now, but we will be hearing from Dr. Thomas Newkirk today. Um, he's the professor emeritus. He is a 2020 scholar in residence and the founder of the Summer Literacy Institutes and the Writers Academy for the University of New Hampshire. He has a brand new book out that we'll be hearing about called Writing Unbound. And we look forward to hearing about, or look forward to hearing from Dr. Newkirk today. Awesome. We also are super excited to hear from Dr. Michael Smith. He's a professor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at Temple University's College of Education. He joined the ranks of those college instructors after 11 years of teaching high school English. He's also the author of various writings on understanding the motivation for adolescents reading and writing in and out of school. Welcome. Thank you. And we also have Dr. Jeffrey Wilhelm with us today, who is on um, the American Reading Company Advisory Board. So a proud partner um, with Dr. Wilhelm. And Dr. Wilhelm is inter internationally known as an author and professor and a teacher. Um, he has had classroom experience for the last 15 years um, and is currently a professor of English education at Boise State University. He's been a professor for the last 20 years, and as I said, also a practitioner in the classroom teaching, really focusing around reading and writing. So welcome, and hand it over to you, Dr. Wilhelm. Great, thank you so much uh, to everybody from ARC for making this happen, and for everybody who's attending, or who'll be watching the recording. We're so grateful you're here with us. I do wanna mention that everything Michael and I are going to be talking about comes from our book, Reading Unbound, why kids need to read what they want and why we should let them. Um, and Tom's new book is literally hot off the press. If you order it right now, it will still be warm when it <laughs> comes to your door. Uh, Tom's experiencing a windstorm in New Hampshire, and so he's having some internet difficulty, but we're hoping he'll be back on in a moment. And if not, Michael and I are prepared to uh, discuss his slides. We've rehearsed them several times. I'm on, Jeff. Oh, he's in. Excellent. This is such good news. Um, all right. So we have three questions we're going to cover today. And the first one is, what is the nature and variety of pleasure in self-selected reading and writing? We're going to look at reading first. In the research Michael and I did, we found that there are four distinct kinds of pleasure in reading and an important subcategory. And the first and prerequisite pleasure is immersive play pleasure. Michael? So our, our research we undertook because both of us as teachers had time and again, kids who wouldn't read in our classes, do, wouldn't do the assigned reading, were always carrying books around with them. So we wanted to find out what they were getting from their out of school reading that they weren't getting in class. And one of the things that we found out was they were getting the immersive pleasure of play. Now play, as you see from this little swing set, when kids engage in play, they engage in for the doing of it. They don't do it for another purpose. It's the, the important thing is the play itself. And the way that that showed in our, in the students that we, in the young people that we talked about was that they wanted to enter the story world. They wanted to live with the characters, inhabit the characters, inhabit the world. So you see, for example, Jazzy saying, I read it, I read it cause I like it. I like living through the story. So that idea of entering the story world and living through the story world was essential to what we call play pleasure. Kylie says, I absolutely believe that the characters are real. So there was this experience that they had of entering a story world so deeply 
that they became one, they came, became part of that world. And while they were in it, what mattered to them was to be in it with the characters in the setting that the characters were in and just imagining themselves as part of that world. And that's what we call play pleasure. So another kind of pleasure we found was social pleasure. And actually there were two kinds of social pleasures. One was the pleasure that reading brought them to relate to other people. So some of those other people were in the, were in the book themselves or in, with the authors. Um, some people talked about how the authors of books were like members of the family, for, for example, and how the characters were people they thought with all the time. But part of it was also being affiliated with other readers so that by, by being a reader, you can connect with other people. And for example, and that, that really resonates with me because when I was growing up, my dad, um, my dad was sick. And we read together. We had a big picture window in front, of, in front of our house and we had a coffee table in between my two chairs, my, uh, one chair and then my dad's chair. And in my house, you better not be in my dad's chair, that kind of. So we would sit together after dinner and we would read. And one of the great experiences of my life was when my dad finished a book. It was the first time I was in an eighth grade. I was in eighth grade. He finished a book. He slid it across the coffee table and he said, the book was Man Child in the Promised Land. And he said, here, this is something you should know about. Don't tell your mother I gave it to you. <laughs> the idea that reading was a, a way to, to affiliate with my dad. So, I, so that sort of connection. And another way is staking your identity. Naming yourself as a reader was part of the identity work that the students in our study did. So for example, one of them said, I'm a real bookworm, or I'm, we're, vampire readers. So, the, so in, interestingly, the social pleasures involve connecting with other people, but also naming yourself as distinct. So the connection with other people, I think, is really well illustrated in the next quote that we have. So here's Jazzy talking about Harry Potter. I'm part of a cultural club that grew up with Harry Potter. It gave me a sense of belonging. I loved wondering what I thought was going to happen, talking to my friends about that aligning myself with characters, waiting so impatiently for the next book. No other group of kids will have that experience again. It kind of marks you as when you grew up and bonds you with other people your age. So that sort of connection was deep. Was deep. My younger daughter, Rachel, as a matter of fact, embarked on an um, unfortunate relationship with a young man um, as, a, as an adult because he was as big a Harry Potter fan as she was. So they, that affiliation is what gave rise to the, to, to the to their relationship. So that sort of connection um, and that sort of de declaring oneself, we call that social pleasure. So we've got play pleasure is one kind of pleasure. We've got social pleasure is another kind of pleasure. I'm getting some social pleasure here because Jazzy is my daughter and she was in the study at the time that we did it. And she's now an English and reading intervention teacher using ARC at Bora High School in Idaho. Hashtag so proud. A third pleasure is intellectual pleasure. And this was figuring things out as a puzzle. Here's Alex. Reading is like being a detective almost. It's taking the evidence and the information and everything that's happened, taking all that and putting it together, processing through it and seeing what ends connect. And then finding once all those ends connect, what that last piece is. Every informant in the study talked about this, about the pleasure of inquiring through their reading into deep thematic meanings, but also into how text are constructed for different kinds of meaning and effect. And they loved figuring things out. By the way, this was the only pleasure that the kids in our study thought school ever promoted at all. But they also thought school undermined it through information-driven approaches where, you know, the kids would complain that the teacher tells you what the text means or would only uh, quiz, information-driven questions, which didn't reward this kind of intellectual puzzle. It's kind of like joke telling. I know you've been told a joke you didn't get, and you probably laughed anyway, which happens but isn't very satisfying. Or maybe you had the guts to ask your friend, you go, I didn't get the joke. And then your friend explained it to you. Well, what did you do then? You didn't laugh because the joy of a joke is in getting it. It's in figuring it out for yourself. And if somebody explains it to you, it's not funny anymore. 
And this was the same thing for our readers. They wanted to figure things out on their own. The next pleasure is work pleasure. And this was using reading as a tool to get something functional done in the world. So it might be reading about a place you were gonna go on a trip or reading about a project um, or car repair. It was when you read something and you could use it and apply it to your life. Uh, kids had work pleasure with reading literature where they felt they were learning things that they could use in their relationships or to think about the world. Here's Helen. I read to discover new stuff to add to what I will eventually create as my ultimate story of epic doom. Yes, epic doom. I read to get ideas for the plot of my epic story of epic doom that I will eventually create. And it is in the process of being created as I already have pretty much all the characters that I will ever use. I might add a few more later on, maybe, but I already have like a hundred. So that might not be a very good idea, dot, dot, dot. Now, Helen, like many of the other informants, used her reading to inform her writing and her writing of fanfics. Uh, and so this was another kind of work pleasure. Now, there was a subcategory of work pleasure that we called inner work pleasure. And I think this might be our most striking finding is that our participants took great pleasure. This was across the board from using their reading to help them become the kind of people they wanted to become. And I really think this was the most intense and moving pleasure. Rebecca had this to say, Characters are ways of thinking, really. They are ways of being you can try on. And this is very similar to what the literary theorist Santayana said, that reading literature is an imaginative rehearsal for living. It helps you rehearse how you want to be and, and who you want to be in the world and how you might become that. So, Michael? So, one of the... Th a story. So... Um, we had finished the book and um, my feeling, and we had worked out, we worked on it for a long time. And when it was done, we, we were happy and I was ready to send it off and not think about it, send it off to the publisher and not think about it. But right as we were wrapping things up and we're going to hit the send on the email, our editor wrote us uh, an email and said, Hey, the study of the study just came out um, that has to do with pleasure reading. And I think you should read it before you finish the book. And we sort of said, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> then we started reading the, reading the study and we found out how it was. So the study was, uh, it was one slice of the British cohort study. And the British cohort study, you might know, followed the lives of more than 17,000 people who were born in the UK in a, a single week of 1970. And what the study was about was to interview them every year I think it was every year, but at least every few years, to find out how they were doing and what the researchers wanted to find out. What were the things that affected somebody's life chances? So what were the things that led people to have happy lives? What were the things that led people to have fulfilling lives? What were the things that led to material success or material difficulty? And the thing, the reason that our editor made us stop the presses was that the analysis established and this is one of the most amazing findings that I've ever read, that reading for pleasure, leisure reading in youth outside of school has a highly significant, has a significant impact on people's, people's later educational achievement and social mobility. In part because pleasure reading actually, and this is a quote from them, increased cognitive progress over time. And here's the amazing, here's an amazing thing to me. When you think about what creates the likelihood of success in a person's life. One of the things is the luck of the, of, of the luck of birth. So one of the things that they found was that doing outside reading, doing le leisure reading had a more significant impact on people's life chances than even their parents' level of education. Now think about that. So for us as teachers, that creates a huge challenge. We can't affect how much education our kids' parents have gotten, but we might be able to affect whether they're going to read outside of our classrooms. That it's our job as teachers to enliven their reading so that they can, they'll do the outside reading and improve their life chances. And that's an enormously, to me, it's an enormously both important finding and challenging finding for us as teachers. I'm going to linger on this slide for just a moment, because if you're familiar with educational research, you know that the thing that over and over again is found to determine 
kids' later um, education, their later educational attainment, their later life success and satisfaction is generally parents' education and socioeconomic status. This study found that reading for pleasure was even more significant than that. So that to me means that pleasure reading is a civil right because it's one thing that we know about that helps kids overcome life circumstances and helps them develop their fullest capacity. So we must consciously and actively promote pleasure and pleasure in reading if we want reluctant readers and writers to access this civil right. And we feel the same way about writing. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Jeff. Um, my work is strangely parallel to work of uh, Michael and Jeff. Uh, early in the early in the 2000s, we both pretty much independently were working with boys writing, me with younger boys writing and they're with older boys reading. And, um, and I was just so impressed by that book. And certainly when I read in 2014, their book, uh, Reading Unbound, it seemed to me that there needed to be a sequel to that, Writing Unbound. So I talked to Jeff and he, he said I could borrow the Unbound and I uh, used that. And uh, so what I found was something very parallel in terms of the pleasures to what they describe. And I'm, I just have basically four pieces of student writing or talk here that I'm gonna share with you to try to make this point. Um, what I have here now is um, a writing from a student who was working um, in a classroom, first grade classroom. This is one of the most amazing pieces of writing I've ever seen. In this classroom, there kind of uh, everybody's interested in Star Wars and they're all writing versions of Star Wars in which uh, Darth Vader and their friends are mingling and having these adventures. And this kid finishes up and says, writing about Count Dooku, okay? You with me? Then to be continued. Now, anybody want to sign, sound out the rest, of the, the rest of the middle part of this? Okay. Da, 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 da obviously the theme to Star Wars. And then you about the last third third of it, you see these upside down U's, all right? Anybody want to sound that one out? That is Darth Vader breathing. <sighs> and then at the very bottom, he said, I just did this for fun. <laughs> I just did this for fun. And it seems to me that this encapsulates a lot of the pleasures that uh, uh, Jeff and Michael were talking about. Uh, he's working with his friends. They're all working with Count Dooku and the Star Wars characters. He's playing around with language so that he creates almost creates two, two new language systems, a language system to involve sound and a language system for breathing. Uh, and he's appropriating popular culture that he's like using parts of popular culture that he loves and connecting with them and using them with his writing. And in the process, he's learning how to write, but he's not working at it, he's playing with it. This is play. Uh, and it's one of my favorite pieces of writing that I've ever seen. So could you go to the next slide? Okay, this is from the same school, not from the same class, but it's the, it shows to me the love of drawing and how drawing is a really important part of, of writing, an important part of play. Uh, so it reads, I got a black belt. I did a supersonic kick. I, I think it's connected. I'm not quite sure. I should have checked that one out. But what this kid is, is a fantastic drawer. And you can see the, the kinetic action of the drawing. And again, you have kids appropriating popular culture because the, you know these kinds of cartoon characters are drawn from popular culture. One of the things that sometimes I hear is that what kids do with popular culture is they copy it. They copy it. And I think that's absolutely untrue. I've never seen a kid just copy from popular culture. What they do is they appropriate it. They take it, they use it, they make it a tool for themselves. They combine popular culture figures with, with their friends, they create their own adventures, they create new characters to be drawn in, they mix and match, they mix and remix, and that's what this, these kids are doing. And you'll kind of see that in the next slide. The same kid, uh, 
and I, I'll try to read this. I didn't transcribe it, but I think it's Cole, and he starts right with, but then he writes, and Evan are, we are super rangers, super warriors. Uh, we won the battle, and then you see this tremendous, this tremendous battle beneath them. One of the points I want to make about this, again, is that he's appropriating popular culture, Power Rangers. Uh, and he's, you know, he is a, a writing this with his friend, so it has that social pleasure. It has that love of drawing, which I think in so, so many schools gets pushed out too soon. You give kids line paper and they're, they're told not to draw or just to stick to the writing or people don't pay attention to the drawing or don't honor the drawing. And so it seems to me again, to show the very same pleasures that uh, Jeff and Michael were talking about, social play. Uh, and also you see them experimenting with invented spelling, uh, uh, Power Rangers, uh, uh, you know, uh, words like that are generally not in first grade spelling lists. Uh, supersonic is usually, to my knowledge, not on first grade spelling list, but these kids are able to try these words and uh, all the evidence shows that, you know, this kind of exercise really helps, you know, facilitate their understanding of sound symbol correspondences, which is huge in terms of writing and reading. So I just have one more. So can I have the next one? I'm having a little trouble reading this because part of my screen is, is pictures that about, uh, uh, Sometimes I write about this little ant named Jojo, a junk food ant, and he goes on these little adventures and I think gets hurt. So sometimes when I write about him, I make, make him like me, feel like I'm him, like when the Red Sox hit a grand slam and he gets caught on the ball and I feel like I'm flying through space like, like this. And he leans back in his chair. I remember this kid, he's I think about third or fourth grade. He leans back on his chair and he's holding on to the baseball, imagining him flying through the air at Fenway Park. So when you're writing about this, you feel like you're in the air. Yeah, when he gets in the air, I'm like up there. I'm Jojo. So here we have, and I know that's gonna be talked about later in, in earlier in early, you talked about identifying with characters. He's identifying with characters, like creating this kind of comic book character, uh, cartoon character, Jojo, and Jojo continues through all his writing. And again, sometimes I felt that kids could latch onto a character and then use it again, use that character again and again and again, pop, perhaps drawn from popular culture. Uh, uh, one, uh, one, one person I interviewed uh, for the book that I just finished uh, latched onto Old Man Jenkins. Now Old Man Jenkins is from SpongeBob SquarePants and this kid picked up uh, old man Jenkins in second grade and started using him and gradually transformed old man Jenkins and morphed through a number of different stages. And he was still writing about old man Jenkins in eighth grade. So old man Jenkins had stayed with him six years, virtually half of his life in terms of the stories he'd written. So again, I think that sometimes we look down on popular culture as something that we want to get away from. What I found is these students, they didn't copy it. They stole it, they changed it, and they made that popular culture their own. So thanks. Thank you, Tom. It strikes me that there's a lot of intellectual pleasure going on here too, and you're figuring out you know, how to spell Power Rangers or how uh, your drawing can contribute to the overall meaning and effect of your writing. So I think there's a, a lot going on here I for the so. kids. Now we're gonna move to the second question which is what are the reasons that schools don't privilege pleasure in reading and in writing? And one reason I think is information-based approaches which dominate American schools. Every review of American education shows that this is the dominant form of teaching. And it gets worse of course, as you go through school, as you go through upper elementary, middle school, high school, and then universities, absolutely the worst. Martin Haberman calls this the pedagogy of poverty because it's been shown through the research that it's the kind of thing that works against equity and it works against historically marginalized populations um, developing their full capacity. So there's really a social equity and social justice angle to all of this. It may be informed by the impulse of teachers to want to be necessary, but it leads to focusing on telling what versus teaching kids how 
to read and create their own meaning and interpretations on their own. And if you want to look at a contrast between information transmission approaches and cognitive apprenticeship transformational teaching approaches, such as those used in ARC, you can go to this bit.ly uh, and I've got a chart and several other pieces of uh, resources that will help you with this webinar. Michael? So another reason that pleasure is not privileged in school, despite its power, despite its importance, and despite the joy the students get from it, is that we have tests to give. We have students to measure. There's a focus on test prep. Right now, I'm doing a, a study with my friend Sarah Levine and uh, Emma Benet and Dan Moore, um, colleagues from Stanford. And what, we're, what we did was we looked at, we looked at 100 years of regents writing about literature prompts and selected six. Uh, one of those was the kind of writing prompt that appears on the SAT, uh, asking kids to, and giving kids a text or an excerpt from a text, text and asking them to analyze that. Others were, 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 were different. They required uh, more imagination, for example. One was imagine, think about the reading that you've done and, and choose two characters from the reading that you've done that you would nominate to be put on a uh, on spaceship to save our, our, to recreate the, the, our society after there was this destruction. But there's this folk, and what we found in our study was that the test, the prompts that were closest to the kind of test prompts that we give kids today, focus sort of narrowly on texts and on rhetorical strategies, led to the kind of pedagogy that Jeff was talking about. So people would say, well, if I were gonna, they said, if I was gonna prepare kids to teach, to write this prompt, the one that asked for this sort of narrow sort of analysis, well, what I'd do is I'd give them a lot of excerpts. What I would do is instead of reading literature, we would read other kinds of, right, we were to dissect. Um, give, instead of reading literature, they read other, key, they read other responses and analyzed those. Um, that they chose text not for the rhetorical power. One of the teachers said, well, I might use um, letter from Birmingham jail, not because of its importance as a historical document or as a social justice document, but because it was quote, littered with rhetorical devices. So we use texts, if there's a focus on test prep, we ask test-like questions that you can answer on the Scantron. We use test-like teaching that where the teaching sort of narrowly approximates just what teachers, what kids are going to be asked to do on the test. Instead of thinking about the broader purposes for literature and writing that brought us into the profession in the, in the first place. So another reason that schools don't privilege pleasure is that the kinds of texts that kids take pleasure in typically are not high status texts. I saw Hard to keep track of the, of the chat, but I saw one of the questions was, well, what about canonical literature? So canonical literature is, is elevated, right? That's the stuff that people are supposed to enjoy reading. I was at my granddaughter's uh, karate lesson once and I was grading a paper, responding to a paper, and the, the woman next to me was reading a book. And I looked over to her and we made eye contact. And I, I said, what are you reading? And she sort of turned away from me physically up the book. She said, oh, nothing, it's just trash. The idea being that she was ashamed of the reading, ashamed in some ways of the reading that she was doing because it was low status. Um, when Jeff and I embarked on the work for, writing, for reading Unbound, we wanted to call the book, let them read trash. The idea being that kids should read what they need to read, what they want to read. But the fact is that different kinds of texts are of different statuses. And schools are supposed to teach high status books. Um, when my daughter, Rachel, my younger daughter, Rachel was a senior in high school, went to back to school night and her, um, her teacher, her 12th grade English teacher said, well, we're reading Canterbury Tales and a couple of Shakespeare plays and they hate it, but if they don't read them now, when are they gonna read it? So that idea of those high status texts del almost deliberately are sort of, sort of anti-pleasure. So that's a factor that we're gonna to have to deal with when we, 
when we think about making pleasure more central to our practice. Another reason that schools don't privilege pleasure in reading is a lack of trust. And this goes back also to the information transmission kind of teaching that tends to dominate American schools. If you're teaching information, you're basically telling the kids what to think and what to do. It's authoritatively imposed and it requires compliance on the part of the kids. It's almost as if you're saying, the curriculum was handed down on stone tablets from Moses himself and you have nothing to say about it and memorize it. And I don't know of any kid, and I've taught grades five through university, who really likes being told what to do and what to think. Kids take great pleasure in figuring things out for themselves and in being internally persuaded. And I think it obtains uh, to this question about canonical literature and popular culture texts as well. One of the things Michael and I found when we were doing our boy study is that the kids would enjoy canonical literature if it was framed in the context of an inquiry. So for instance, if instead of teaching Romeo and Juliet, you said, ooh, we're gonna look in to this really compelling issue about what makes and breaks relationships. I mean, what ninth and 10th grader doesn't care about that? It's a central object of their daily inquiry and daily life. And we found that when teachers reframed the teaching of canonical literature from, I'm gonna tell you what it means to we're gonna figure out not only what this means, but what it means for us in our lives and how we might apply it, that the kids would embrace that canonical literature. Now, this lack of trust issue is kind of thinking that kids won't challenge themselves, they'll just read the easy stuff and they won't read what will elevate them or expand their capacities. And again, hearkening back to not only this study, the Reading Unbound study, but our Reading Don't Fix No Chevy study, we found that just to be absolutely false. We found that the kids actually complained more that school was too easy than that it was too hard. It actually surprised us at first. And then we thought about it some more and we thought, wow, you know, Eric Erickson, has taught us that the primary task of early to late adolescence is to stake your identity, which you do through your evolving interest and competence. And since developing new interests and new competence and getting smarter is your human developmental journey, of course, you're going to want hard stuff. You're going to want a challenge, but you're going to want to be helped to meet the challenge yourself, not to be told what something means, but to be helped to make the meaning yourself. Now, here's one last thought. Textual complexity versus interpretive complexity. There's been a lot of talk about textual complexity uh, over the last several years. And one thing we found in the Reading Unbound study is that the kids would meet all of the standards that were in these next generation standard documents, Common Core, et cetera, reading whatever it was they loved. So we think we should pay more attention to interpretive complexity and to complexities that may be surprising and unexpected. Here's an example from Rory. Rory was a kid in our study who loved graphic novels. And he said, the first time I read a graphic novel, I usually just kind of skim through it and then I'll read it a couple of times. And the second time I'll read it, I'll read it for the words in the story. But usually about the third time I read it, I'll look at the pictures and I'll look how they work. So he was reading over and over again, the same text. And every time he was trying to dig deeper into that intellectual pleasure of figuring out how the pictures worked with the text to construct different meanings and effect. So with the graphic novel, he was achieving all the goals that are required. I think of any expert reader, but also of the standards documents and tests we're working with. So perhaps we should trust kids more. Tom? Okay, I think that in some ways, writing is perceived as even more labor than reading. So I think that in a way, there's more headwind to make writing pleasurable than there is reading. Uh, and I want to just look through about four reasons why writing is not perceived as pleasurable. So next slide. Okay, this is just a red pen. A red pen used to mark errors. What I think with, write, with writing, I think we feel so vulnerable. Uh, reading, we can read and it's in our head unless we have to read out loud and nobody sees it. But writing is meant to be read by somebody and that makes us vulnerable. Plato said that writing is like sending out your children unprotected. 
And that's often how we feel about it, right? We, we, we feel ourselves unprotected and subject to possibly really negative responses, um, sometimes so severe that they stay with us. And I'll just briefly tell you the story of my, when I was a freshman at Oberlin and on my first blue book in history, I uh, got an F and I can see the markings. I can see the handwriting still in my head to see the handwriting from the teacher and the comment was, which was, this is more bull than knowledge. Now the answer was not a good answer. It was my first blue book, my first essay exam at Oberlin. But that moment is like what psychologists call a spotlight moment. We remember it vividly. We can still feel what we felt at the time. And I think so many people have that experience. So there's almost a, an undoing that has to happen because we were vulnerable. And then at some point, somebody's sarcastic, negative, and we feel shame and that stays with us. Next. I think sometimes frequently students feel that school writing is depersonalized. It's nothing about them. They may have no choice in the writing. They may be asked to write in without using I, and they may be asked to write often about a literary topic as they get older, for which they have really no personal connection and they feel no personal stake in that writing. Now, I think, I think literature is fine to write about. I don't think it's the only thing to write about. And I think there's lots of ways to write about it. But Eve here, it's just this, you know, it was a student that I interviewed and she really resisted the kind of writing she was being asked to do in school. And she said to me, as I grow as a person becoming more capable, anything I write, I try to have a purpose, try to have it reflect me in some way. The core of humanity is storytelling, embracing our differences, sharing our views. And there's a term that I've stolen from a man named Jeff Wilhelm, and you, maybe you too, Michael Smith, I don't know, but it's an identity theme that we write from identity themes, powerful interests that really kind of define who we are. And I think what Eve is saying is very profound because she's saying she needs to write from these deeply held beliefs, these deeply held sense, sense of who she is. And when she, when she is asked to write and there can be no connection to those things, she's, she's resistant and she finds it a deeply unpleasant experience. So in this sense, all writing comes from a personal place. And, less, and when students can't feel that way, uh, they feel writing is just a, an alienating experience. Next. Okay, this is also something that really, I think, irritates students. Uh, uh, they're asked to write to a strict formula. And I think if, if you Google hamburger, you know, hamburger paragraph or hamburger essay, you're gonna find a gazillion images of hamburgers and this is just one of them. Um, and students don't like you know, I mean, there's a, there's a utility maybe on standardized tests when you have a short period of time to write and you have to get something down. It could be a survival genre, but it's not how writers write and it's not what we want to read because anything written to this formula is going to be formulaic and not interesting. And so I think the fact that all, so much expository writing is about formulas like this alienates students, makes writing seem like filling in slots, doesn't privilege what people want to say. And, uh, and I think it tell, it's perpetuates the lie that, you know, if you write like this, when you get to college, you're gonna you know, be successful. But when you get to college, you're gonna have to do a lot more complicated things than what you're looking at here. And I think what you're being sold a bill of goods because you're gonna have to create, create more complicated essays. And sometimes I hear, well, you have to learn the rules before you break the rules. Well, these aren't the rules. I mean, this isn't how writers write. So who said these are the rules? I think we do a better job looking at real essays and kind of inductively figuring out how they work. So I have a comment that a student makes about uh, this. This is Eve again. When I write an essay, this is school essay. When I write an essay, they're either right or wrong. They're passing or they're failing. And the thing with creative writing is there's no right or wrong. It's expression left to interpretation. I think that not only don't, don't they know how to assess creative writing, but they want to have a more practical student, if that makes sense, because schools care so much about practicality and sending kids off to college and having good records. So everything is reduced. 
So formula, the formula, having the right to formulas is I think one way in which students are alienated from school writing. Next. Can I have the next slide there? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Um, and certainly one issue for teachers, and this is a huge topic that I'll just be able to talk about briefly, is dealing with violence and inappropriateness in, in fiction. Uh, now, one thing that always interests me is when, when I would go into schools, when I was doing this earlier work on boys writing, um, I would I'd say, uh, do you have like rules about not having violence in, in student writing? And a lot of the schools would say, oh yes, we have those kinds of rules, no violence. And then I would say, do you have those same rules for reading? And they would pause <laughs> because of course they couldn't have that rule, you know? I mean, what would happen to Romeo and Juliet? What would ha happen to Hamlet? What would happen to Beowulf? You know, you know, violence, trouble is part of plot. And so, uh, so for some reason, it was, it was it's somehow ennobling to read Hamlet with all those people being poisoned and, and you know, uh, killed by swords at the end of Hamlet, but to, to write something like that, you know, means you have to go down to the guidance counselor. So I just, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, so I think that there are times when students get, you know, when the writing goes out of bounds, but my experience in talking to teachers is the best way to do that is not to create a rule, but to say, how does this work in your story? Nonstop violence after a while gets boring. I think most students really want to, to create suspense and they can look to books that do this well as, as models. So, um, so I mean, it's, it's a very complicated issue. The one rule that I would say holds for writing is that you, you know, the same rule that I think holds for school conduct, which is respect for others, that you cannot write something that makes other people in the class fearful, ashamed, embarrassed. You know, that's a rule that applies to behavior and that's a rule that should apply to writing. But it seemed to me to, to prohibit violence in all its forms is really to alienate students because they know that that's part of the fiction that they read. So those are some of the some of the barriers, I think, in terms of writing in school. Thanks so much, Tom. As you were talking, it struck me that formulas are a kind of information transmission. It's an authoritative imposition as this is the way you have to write and it requires your compliance. And that stands in stark contrast to what we know from Anders Ericsson and other researchers about the development of expertise, that expertise actually resides in mental models. And mental models are modular. So there's gonna be must make moves of doing an argument of interpretation or writing a narrative, but there's gonna be a lot of wanna make moves and they can be moved around and used in creative ways. And kids are very playful. You know, it reminds me of Robert Frost's poem, Two Tramps in Mud Time, where he says that only when work and play are one will the job ever be done for heaven and the future's sake. You know, and so even when kids are doing work and substantive work and digging deep, they, they want this playful element of it. Okay, this is the final section of our talk, our third question. What moves can teachers make to foster pleasure in reading in the classroom at home and during summer? In fostering the pleasure of play, there's obviously many ways to do this, but one that really strikes me and has been big throughout my career is drama and education techniques like revolving role play or in role writing or hot scening, uh, good angel, bad angel, anything that helps you relate to characters or imagine different ways of being. If you go into an elementary school classroom as I've done many times and you say to the kids, let's do a drama, they are so all about it. And it is so easy to do a drama um, that involves their reading. My daughters, uh, when they were growing up, they used to do dramas all the time of Matilda and of uh, the series of unfortunate events. And, and they would do it all the time outside the home and in the home. And it strikes me too, that one of the great powers of drama and of play is that you don't have to speak for yourself. You can have your thoughts mediated by a literary character. And I'm just thinking right now at this current cultural moment, if I wanted to talk to my students or some kids about um, the George Floyd trial, you know, one thing I could do is to ask them to think about the hate you give and say, what would Starr say about the George Floyd trial? What would her father say? What would her boyfriend maybe understand or not understand? And that would be a way to have a conversation in 
you know, through drama and education techniques where the kids wouldn't have to speak for themselves where they say, well, I think Star would think that or think this. Now I'm gonna just ask rhetorically, what do you already do or could you do to promote the prerequisite pleasure of play for reading and writing in your classroom or at home or what could you encourage kids to do during the summer? Michael? Okay, so we talked about intellectual pleasure and one of the things, uh, 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 important insight that I got, it relates to the power, to the pleasure of play as well, is that um, our friend Peter Rabinowitz made what I think is really a uh, profound statement in its simplicity. And he said that the essential characteristic of teaching literature across, for the most part is that teachers are teaching texts that they read, that they've read many times to kids who are reading them for the first time. And one of the things, so what happens is as you read and reread, the more time you read a book, the more important nuance becomes. So I don't know, first time you read the Scarlet Letter, you might think, what's a woman like Hester doing with a guy like Dimsdale? How does that make sense? Why does she stay in? Um, should I stay or should I go? Those are the questions that you're thinking about. Um, when you've read it 10 or 12 times, as, as I did, because I read it every semester I taught it, then you start noticing stuff like hat motifs. But, one of the th but in the intellectual pleasure, it's the engaging the kids in the pleasure of their finding out. So it's sort of problematic, some of the things that we do as, um, as teachers. For example, if you ask a question about a particular detail in a text, you've done the noticing that kids need to do, right? You've done, the, you've done the noticing that kids need to do. For them to have intellectual pleasure, they have to notice themselves. So one of the things that you might think about doing is read a book or a poem or a story for the first time along with your students. Uh, now, uh, the pressure's on here because the study that I did with a wonderful English teacher, Bill Connolly, who just made a comment in the chat, it, we looked at uh, Bill teaching poems, reading in a couple of different conditions. One of them was, what happens when I choose the poem and I bring in a class set of these poems and Bill's reading them with his kids for the first time. And one of the things, and Bill, don't correct me even if I am wrong. One of the things, um, one of the things that, that I think Bill felt was that he could be more of himself when he was as a reader, as an expert reader, when he was reading along with the kids for the first time, because he didn't have all the cards. He, they were trying to figure something out together. They changed the dynamic of of the class. It also makes things more genuine. So I've got a whole rant prepared on this, but I'll just, I'll just say it simply. Question about what does this foreshadow can only be answered when you finish the book. You don't know what it's foreshadowed until you're done. So what does this foreshadow doesn't, doesn't work. It's, it's a question that's, that sort of um, tells a lie about how we go about reading ourselves. So one of the things that I think that you could do, and I would recommend that you do, is work is to read a, a text, read text with your kids for the first time along with them. Ask, you know, ask a teaching partner to bring in a text, to bring in a poem or a story that relates to the inquiry that your class is doing, and reading and read it along with them. That would be one way to foster intellectual pleasure because they know you don't have all the cards and you're sort of more on equal footing. Now I just ask you to think for a minute about what are some other ways that you could promote genuine intellectual pleasure with reading and writing in your classrooms. So another thing I think that we should, would think about is how to foster social pleasure. So uh, the first point here is is something that Jeff taught me. And, and I think that I've learned from Jeff that I didn't, sh when I was teaching high school, I didn't share myself as a reader enough with my kids, the books that I love, what I was reading, what I was thinking about. One of the things that Jeff has pointed out, he's gotten a lot of work done by saying to, the, saying to a class, okay, you all work together and figure out a book that we're gonna read and I'll read it with you. But then I'm going to figure out a book of mine that one of my favorites, and you're, I'm going to ask you to read it with me. So it's one of yours, one of mine. But another thing I think is really important, and that this was Warren Culp made this point in the chat, is to have a free reading program and promote books to through book talks, reading conferences, 
online reviews, literature circles and book clubs. One of my good friends every week had a book club and he divided class and the, the, the host, he had this, the host had to choose the book and the host had to bring the treats. And so there was, and, and that was, those were the only rules, okay? And, and so he, Steve Littell's idea was that if you do this, it, it changes, it makes it more like an adult book club. It makes it a more social occasion. But I've been in a book club I, for um, 27 years uh, here in Philadelphia. And some of my closest friends are in that book club, even though I see most of them only through, only in the book club, because the books let us talk about stuff that we wouldn't talk about in our day-to-day -day conversations. So again, we'd ask you to think about what are some ways that you could foster social pleasure? Thanks so much, Michael. The last two slides that Michael talked about really foregrounded for me the problem of authoritative discourse in a classroom. You know, when you, when the teacher is seen as an authority who's imposing activities or meanings on you, then it undermines the social pleasure of collaboration. And it's interesting because information driven approaches position the teacher as an authority, but cognitive apprenticeship approaches, such as those that are used by ARC, positions the teacher as a collaborative participant, a collaborative reader, a thinking partner. And then you can engage in those intellectual and social pleasures with the kids. Fostering work pleasure, frame text and units as inquiry. This is a favorite move of mine as a problem to be solved by using essential questions and working towards a culminating project, service, and social action. Whenever you frame a unit as a problem to be solved, you're gonna be doing all kinds of work, intellectual work, but you're gonna come up with themes and findings and takeaways that you can apply to your life in functional ways. So what are some other ways that you already or could do to promote the pleasures of work? And then let's go to inner work, which again is my favorite, and these imaginative rehearsals for living. Um, you know, it was interesting that when COVID hit, my friend Jerry Hendershot, who's uh, a member of my Boise State Running Project, he and his family decided that they would uh, build a chicken coop and start raising chickens. And of course, that's a work pleasure. They did a lot of reading about breeds and how to build the, the, the coop and all this kind of thing. But then it became kind of an inner work because the kids started thinking about how they could leave, live more sustainably and make their house more green and become zero waste. Uh, and I think basically any of the things we've talked about um, on our slides here could become ways of doing inner work and imaginally re rehearsing who I wanna be in the future and then taking action in that direction. So again, we'd ask, what do you already do or what could you do to promote inner work and its pleasures? Since the highly engaged readers that we studied all engaged in all these pleasures all the time. If we wanna encourage kids to be readers and we want them to read like expert engaged readers, then we need to foreground and we need to encourage and prompt all of these pleasures. Tom? Okay. I think we're getting near the end of our time, so I'll run through these fairly quickly. Uh, this is just seven quick things that I'd like to suggest to, to encourage pleasure in reading and engagement. Lots of low risk writing, quick writes, shared but ungraded. Uh, check out Linda Reeves, the Quick Write Handbook. Uh, and also, and to, to go back to what was said earlier about reading, I think to write with them. And this has been one of the great pleasures of my teaching was the early part of a class just to write with my students on just a whole variety of topics. For beginning writers, encourage a mix of drawing and writing. I think we've seen that. Cartoons in play. Uh, for re really young kids, good markers and big online paper, almost irresistible. And if they want to start putting in words, teach them how to do, you know, word bubbles, talk bubbles and thought bubbles. Be a good reader of student writing, responsive and positive. Encourage writers to talk about their process and think ahead to what they might write. Uh, in conferences, I think it's important, certainly in midstream, you know, to get them to talk through where they're going and what they might do and how, what they might add. Four, provide help when needed, but don't overstructure. Too much pre-planning and attention to rubrics can get in the way. I know people have varying opinions about rubrics, and, um, but a lot of the writers that I talked to who are doing fiction felt that they were, oh, things were overplanned and basically 
turned into kind of a formula or a, 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 too much structured. So they felt they'd lost the capacity to be, to really write freely and creatively. Five, and this is a quote from, actually, I think, uh, re, uh, uh, Re reading no Chevy's. Chevy's. Yeah, yes, right. It's, Chevy. it's always better with friends. Always. It's always better with friends. Okay, I don't have the quote quite right. Uh, uh, but just, you know, options where kids can, can write with either on the same topic, which I saw that, you know, they might not be writing the same story, but they might be writing with the same characters, you know, that kind of social play, peer response. Uh, so writing is not a, a lonely, solitary thing. Uh, six. Uh, and I think this is the point I tried to make earlier. It's natural for young writers to draw on popular media, and probably not, not just young writers as well, because I think, you know, uh, if you look at fan fiction, they're drawing on popular media as well. Um, and there's a tendency to look down upon that, to think that's derivative. But I think if you look carefully, they're using those things creatively. Uh, Anne Dyson, particularly, has done brilliant work to show how young writers take on whatever popular media they have, that they have tools, but they might not be high status tools. Seven, make a place for fiction and make a place for narrative. Uh, too often, narrative is seen as a low, low, low difficulty kind of writing that you get out of the way in ninth grade, then you move on to the real stuff. But I think we're storytelling animals. Uh, we need fiction, we need story. That's, that's our primary way of understanding the world. And I'd like to just finish my section with a quote from Ursula Le Guin. So if I could have the next slide. Um, the story from Rumpelstiltskin to War and Peace is one of the basic tools invented by the human mind for the purpose of understanding. There have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. So thank you. Thank you so much. Remember that the problem is that reviews of teaching in American schools show that teaching is typically purveying information or content. And that's gonna be very authoritative and it's gonna mirror what's called the pedagogy of poverty. Instead of cultivating mastery of why and how experts engage and how experts know, think and do things. If you're thinking about summer success and how to make up for any learning loss and how to promote engagement with readers, these are the things you have to think about, access, pleasure, volume. I think those three things are fairly easy to do. Some other things are assistance to outgrow oneself because growing more competent is a linchpin of motivation and one of the great pleasures. Deliberate practice over time, working on getting better on something contributes to that and providing visible signs of growth and accomplishment. However, how summer reading programs usually work, don't meet that, Tom? So or, excuse me, Michael. Yeah. I just, it seems to me that summer reading is designed at least to some extent to suck the life out of, out of reading. Um, I'm, when my daughter Catherine was a, was a senior in high school, the summer reading book was, sub, was Studs Terkel's working, 500 pages of interviews. She had never read a book like that before. She didn't, it was too hard for her. It was, she was not something that she would ever pick, pick out. So it's not linked personally. So I, I would just encourage you, I know we're running out of time here, but as a school, instead of talking about summer read, assigning summer reading books, I would encourage you to think about crafting summer reading contracts where kids, where you, your kids write what they, will, what they will read and then have them make something that's associated with, with the reading. And then they're gonna choose things that are appropriate and useful to them. So, uh, but with, with, without giving a payoff, Without giving preparation or payoffs, summer and without cultivating interest, I don't see how summer reading can 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 be useful to kids. Thanks, Michael. If you are trying to set up a summer of successful reading, um, art can be of great help to you uh, with the access, the pleasure, the engagement, and volume, the assistance to outgrow themselves, uh, visible signs of growth and accomplishment, etc. We're nearly out of time, but let me just say that Tom's written a wonderful book and it's on sale right now at Heinemann.com. And of course, um, you know, our book won the Russell Award three years ago for distinguished contributions to English education. We'd love it if you bought that. ARC people, is there any burning questions that you think have to be answered or people will stay awake tonight or any conclusion you'd like to give? 
Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Wilhelm, Dr. Newkirk, and Dr. Smith. Um, I think you got the questions in the chat box as they were happening and as they related to your presentation. I, I would just say something that stood out to me um, throughout your presentation about the pleasure of reading and writing is the role of the teacher versus the role of the student. And the obstacles that many times we may face may be because the teacher doesn't understand their role. So I really took away that intellectual pleasure and um, definitely going to try that idea of reading a book for the first time. Um, makes me think of cognitive apprenticeship and how the teachers in there with the student learning while doing it with them. So thank you. Um, Shadana, anything? Yeah, I just again wanted to say thank you all for sharing your wisdom today. I think we all took away some big nuggets from the share and definitely got lots of ideas in the chat as well from participants. So thank you to those of you who have been sharing ideas via chat. It's a great way for us to continue to network and learn from each other. Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm walking away with thinking more about is this whole idea, um, Dr. Wilhelm, that you shared around textual complexity versus uh, interpretive complexity, right? And really allowing kids that space to go back into text when they need to and not kind of pushing them on to something else, but really allowing them to go back and, and get whatever they were missing or what they needed to go deeper in. I mean, I think with our core, of course, and uh, wide reading that we provide that opportunity by ensuring access to multiple texts at various levels so kids can do that uh, deeper reading that they're so desiring. So thank you again for all of your shares. And again, thank, thank you to those who have joined us and for sharing your insight um, with each other.